Willie D. Live. Peace, family. Brother Derek Muhammad here. Uh, I'm guest hosting today on Willie D. Live for my brother, Willie D. As you can see, we're live from the barbershop in Southwest Houston. But we got a special guest in the city. He's almost not even like a guest. This is our <laughs> brother, the one and only Killer Mike. Killer Mike. Hey, Thanks for stopping by to see us today, no, brother. Honored to be here, brother. Man, Derek. can we do something live? Like, like give him a hey, I'm, I'm clap happy. it up. Hey. You know, we from the South. We believe in clapping it up. Happy to be here. Yes, sir. Bro, again, thanks for being here. Uh, let's just hop right into it. Yeah. Let's talk about Michael. Yeah. Michael. I remember when Muhammad Ali changed his name. Yeah. And, you know, people were trying to berate him saying, your mama named you Cassius. Just, I'm going to call you Cassius. <laughs> right. He your mother will. named you Michael. Am I yeah. correct? Yeah. My mother Rendell. named you Michael. Michael Render. Yeah. Michael Santiago Render. Yes, sir. Atlanta, I told her Georgia. she thought I was going to look Puerto Rican like my dad. <laughs> I ended up just looking black like her. God bless my soul. <laughs> My father light skinned with the curly hair, so I told her that when she came on the exotic middle name. But yeah. she named me his first name. My father was named for the angel Michael, and I was named for him and my daughter. And I have a son named Michael, all named for me. Beautiful, beautiful. So you went from Michael, and the, the, the name that the culture gave you is Killer Mike. Yeah, Killer Mike. And so now the new album, which everybody's ranting and raving yeah. about, you go back to Michael. You go yeah. from Michael to yeah. Killer Mike. Back to Michael. Yep. yep. What was the significance of naming your album Michael? Oh, well, it's, I mean, it's my 20th year in rap, but people had never met Michael. They met versions of Michael that they liked. So, you know, mm -hmm. some people like Killer Mike the rapper. Some people like Michael Render, who they saw, you know, as active. And some people like Mike the businessman. But I had never on record given people fully who I was. Mm -hmm. You know, you sign a major deal, you know, you end up, you have to, you have to partner with a major company and they get to make some decisions you don't have much say on. So, you know, singles got picked for me. I was signed to Outkast, so people viewed me in proxy to them. Mm -hmm. um, Grand Hustle was a recorded home. T.I. was like my brother and friend. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I had always been attached to something that was bigger. Mm -hmm. But people just never got to meet me. So I think it's important that people meet you, you know. So mm -hmm. I said, before, you know, I got sick with COVID. Before they even gave it a name, I was flat on my face for like 14 days. Right after, I'm one half of a very successful rap group called Run the Jewels. Mm -hmm. I'd argue we the best rap group going today. And um, I, 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 I could have just, you know, for the last decade, we've been doing great. You know, mm -hmm. we've been, been touring the world, been around the world four times, 123 shows a year. We do very well. Mm -hmm. But I was like, man, if I died today, I'd only be known as Killer Mike. You know, ah. one half, and Killer Mike is a character, uh, you know, of an of a MC that a nine-year-old boy imagined. You know, I wanted to be the most badass, swaggering MC. It mm -hmm. was, you know, I wanted to be like Cube. I wanted to be like Face. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I wanted to be like Ice T. But at my core, I'm just this little boy. Mm -hmm. I'm Denise's son. And I wanted everybody to have an opportunity to meet a black boy from a black enclave in Atlanta who grew up empowered. I didn't have to search for black empowerment. I already grew up in it and yeah. knew it and thrived in it. So I just wanted people to understand me as I interviewed and stuff. I realized how many people were misunderstanding me mm -hmm. and the things I was saying. So I was just like, let me put down a personal testimonial. With my, with my trials and triumphs, you know, my, my lows in the valley and my peaks on the mountain. Almost like an autobiography. Yeah, yeah, with well, the beginning of one, because it's going to be three series. It's going to be two more Michaels. Oh, know? okay. Yeah, so, but I wanted to introduce people first to this who I am and why I am. You know? Man, beautiful, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. So I don't know what you've been hearing, but what I've been hearing is that this is Killer Mike's best work Today. Yeah, and I've had some great work. 11 years ago, I gave him a classic album with rap music. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, um, if you go in the Trap Museum, Trap Music Museum Tips has my first album, Monster Up, is the first attempt at a at a uh, conscious trap album. So mm -hmm. I've been making great work, but this is the absolute, this is the whale I've been chasing for mm -hmm. 20 years. Like, if you've read Moby Dick, you, you know, I was I was intent on, on getting this reaction out of people. But I'm interested, time. where did it come from? Because... You know, they say rap is a quote unquote young man's game. Yeah, that's what they say. That's what they say, yeah, right? Yeah. But it, they say the same about same thing about basketball. Yeah. They say the same thing about football. But then you got Tom Brady. He winning yeah. championships at the age of forty or whatever, yeah. right? But the point that I'm making is, like, how do you produce your back work? I mean, your best work on what some people would consider the back end of your career. You what is it, where does that come from? You can't think about what some people think. I Love don't even it. know some people. You know, I know my people. My people believe in me. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I remember watching uh, um, Muhammad Ali walk into a fight, I think, with um, who's it? It, it was uh, my boy Foreman. And he said, man, what y'all looking sad for? 
Y'all already look like I done lost the fight, like I'm dead or something. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's, you know, my people, man, they, they, they give it to me. That was, that was somebody on my team that, that questioned if I could do it and my age. And we, get, we, gone, we went ahead and fired him. He got on out of there. Yeah, it was time for him to go. Everybody else seemed to be believers yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 you know, God Good bless rims. him and whatever he doing. But he gone. But, you know, I got a, I got a, uh, I got a young, scrappy manager, man. He been, we've been at this thing about, you know, our daughters are 16. So we've been at this thing about 16 years together. You know, Will Bronson from Acting Management, and he's just a believer. It's amazing what you can do with somebody when you believe in yourself, but when you got a crew that believe in you, mm. you just, you can't fail them. Mm -hmm. You're going to work harder, you're going to push a yard, try to get an extra inch. You know what I mean? So I just have a lot of people encouraging, so I couldn't, I couldn't let them down. Mm -hmm. Couldn't let myself down, and it's just a moment in time for me, for, for, for a, a, a growth of the what to expect out of black men as rappers. You know what I mean? I, like I, I knew that I had something to offer. The same 16-year-old boy that was trapping, mm -hmm. that was that was trapping and at the same time getting knowledge of self is the same 25-year-old young man that got offered a record deal mm -hmm. and is the same 35, 45-year-old person. But I've grown, I've matured, I've learned things. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to put it down. I knew it was an audience for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and, I, and, I, and I suspected and the, and the suspicion proved true. Yeah, the suspicion definitely proved true. Um, Man, let me let's give him a round of applause for Michael for, for the album. I hate to turn this into a church service or a mosque. No, that's, that, that, that's what the album intended that's to exactly do. That's exactly what it is, yeah, what what it is brother. Um, next question. We're celebrating 50 years of hip hop. Yeah, right we now, are. Right, but 30 years up from the Public Enemy era. Yeah. 30 years up from the, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. Yeah. Hip hop played a role in that. Yeah. Hip hop is too young to have say that we directly played a role in the civil rights movement. Yeah. Um, but then there was the George Floyd movement. My question to you, what do you think about the state of activism in hip hop right now? I'm, I'm, I'm always happy. It, with rappers as activists has always been quirky or, or tricky. Mm -hmm. But rappers using their platform to aid activists always has been and always will be. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can, you can, in terms of the rappers uh, that come out of the places in the South that I know and love, whether it be Atlanta or Memphis or Jacksonville, Nola, you know, he's talking about Houston and stuff, Dallas, people have always said things that were socially conscious, mm -hmm. you know, in the midst of, in the midst of bouncing and shaking and gyrating. Right, right, right. We, we'll give you something. So it's always been there to always be there. What I'm happier to see now these days is people who actively know the activists. You now, rappers will tell you now, you know, right, right. you got to listen to, you got to listen to Tez Figaro. You got to, you got to check out what Charlemagne is saying on this. You got to, you got to listen to the minister. Like, I remember when the minister came down and called Mr. Lewis Farrakhan for people who don't know what I'm talking about. Um, he called all those rappers in too, and there was some unrest going on around the George Floyd thing. He calls the Tree Sound Studios um, in Atlanta, and all everybody showed up. You know, me, mm -hmm. Tilt, Two Chains, but I think Boosie might as well. Lou Duval was meeting with that, but he, he warned us against inciting violence because mm -hmm. he's seen it before the '60s and '70s. He said, you know, you can incite violence to give you momentary satisfaction. He said, but you guys are safeguarded from it. What you going to do when they block off a neighborhood for two weeks and they cut off the water mm -hmm. and they don't allow food in and out and then your women and children starving? He made everybody in that room think that mm -hmm. we like we had never thought before. You know, mm -hmm. everybody talks about the revolution. They think about taking up arms and overtaking the government. She's, that didn't work too well for white folks on January 6th. You know? <laughs> and so when, when, you look, when you look at the most, most revolution, revolutionary thing you can do, really only two people have done it has been, say, a Marcus Garvey and Elijah Muhammad in that raise your own economic workforce, yes, create your own farms, grow your own food, Do teach your self. own children. That's the real revolution. So he, he helped us understand that in that day. And after that day, you saw brothers uh, from Thug put, put, put it in his music. Mm -hmm. Future had put it in his music. Two Chains went and visited him. So for me, man, it's, it's just about we accept guidance mm -hmm. and we accept the wisdom. And it's in the music. You're not going to hear it most of the time the adults because you don't want to hear it. But kids hear it. They move. When I did the Black Banking Movement, God bless the dead, Young Dolph, Thug, I remember Ra Ra Tilt was some of the first people that showed up. You know, Thug hadn't even had a bank account. I think he was still keeping his money in the floor. <laughs> that was you like know? 2016. Yeah, that, that. Brother, that brother showed up and brought a lot of brothers with him. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's active. If you want to find the good and see the good is there, I remember the, the song Run that's on my album. People say, well, I don't know why Mike had Thug on it. He's not saying nothing. But no, you're not listening. Mm -hmm. 
you know, mm-hmm. he said, he said, I'm thinking the same, but I ain't banking the same. He talked about buying his girl some jewelry. Mm-hmm. So he's still going to buy his girl the jewelry, the burger bag, but now he's doing it out of a black bank. That's he's progress. investing with a black bank. But if you're not listening, if you don't want to see it, you're not going to see it. He said, um, I'm going to take the children, put them on a yacht. You know, we're going to escape on a yacht. And I just envisioned on that part where he was putting all us back and reversing the transatlantic trade chain, putting children back, taking them back to Africa. So my thing is, if your imagination or your logic won't let you see it, you're not going to see it, but it's there. Yeah, it's yeah. The activism is still there. In the That's music, real. You know? That's real. And That's the right. business ownership. I got to say, you know, hip-hop has always been defined as, you know, you, you, you DJ, you B-boy, what they call breakdancing, graffiti, and writing, and then emceeing. But I would add business as a fifth pillar. What you see now is every rapper represents a certain amount of jobs and commerce. And, and that's business. a big part of the that activism. That's a huge that's economic part of activism. Yeah, absolutely. Without that, you don't have anything. No, you, you don't. No, if you, you don't. look at right now African nations that are making deals with Russia, it's based on the economy. And they say, well, the rest of the Western world has never treated us fairly mm-hmm. from an economic standpoint. So right now, the U.S. dollar, I don't think it's going to break totally, but it definitely is under fire because finally people are saying, well, I'm tired of it. And you look at Russia for giving $56 billion in debt. When France gonna forgive the false debt that Haiti has on, that it doesn't really owe? You understand mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And if hip hop doesn't rap about it or don't talk about it, the young people don't know. So I just say, but I'll be more encouraging. I would encourage 40 and 50 year olds to be less discouraging because that's what they did to us. Come on, they did that to us with Public Enemy. They did mm-hmm. that to us with the Coop. They did that to us with Goody Mob. They discouraged every step of the way, but yet we made it. We did it. So I think we should become more encouraged and less discouraged. Yeah, that's part of the Willie Lynch cycle, like they say: separate the young. From the yeah, old. yeah. You know, somebody got to bridge the gap. Yeah, I'm and gonna that's not just us. It works other places too. I was I was watching something that was talking about North Korea and how they operate. Mm-hmm. They operate by making the state the parent essentially. You know, your state becomes you. You the children get the snitching on the parent of who's doing what because the control gets out of your direct control. So hip hop, we have to be parents and we have mm-hmm. to be uncles and, and, and aunts and we have to be elders and we have to give children the truth. You know, you can't you can't shame them for bouncing and shaking and you went to freak me you got to say well hey i went to freak me right. and then this is so let me tell you how not to get freaked out your knee you know what i'm saying we got, we got to. <laughs> right and yeah, our parents listen to teddy pendergrass oh man my mom loved teddy and our grandparents listen to worse music than that I grab I asked my granddad one time, I said, man, what you think about NWA you niggas without two? He say, man, I ain't never old Stagger Lee. Them niggas ain't saying nothing new. <laughs> <laughs> and it helped me understand that I um, you know, nothing I'm going through is new. Yeah, There's nothing but, new under the but sun. But what is it about us? We have it's it's like we have to compete for generational supremacy. My yeah. generation was better than yours. Because <coughs> the more I get up in age, I hear my friends tell the youngsters things like uh, you know, the music don't sound like it sounded back when I was. Nah, you know, I hear we, we enter into more back in our day yeah. conversations. Because that's what felt good to you. It felt good in your day, but you got to be honest about your day now. You weren't mm-hmm. always right, you know. Absolutely. And I, I remember talking to George Clinton, interviewing him in my barbershop, one my, my original barbershop. Uh, and he said, man, when I don't like something, I know usually I'm on to something. Because my grandkids will come along and tell me what they like about it. He said, I give it a second chance and I... I listen with an un, unbiased ear. That's and real. you just got to get like that. You got to find commonality. You know what I'm saying? You ain't got to like it. You know what I mean? Like I, I said in an interview, I say, I, this album, I, I'm the best. I don't care if you super lyrical, empirical, lyrical, or you mumble. Blah, blah, blah. Don't matter to me. I, I put it, I, I did the best this year. But I listen to everything. My mm-hmm. kids, I, when I get with my kid, I have a 16-year-old daughter, I have a 25-year-old daughter, I sit with them like, what you listening to? What you got? Like the uh, the sexy red song, my, my 25 year old daughter said. She said, "Daddy, uh, I'm gonna play this. I don't want you to hear, but I'm gonna play." I said, "Let me hear, let me hear." When I heard it, I said, "Well, damn!" I said, "That's almost like the first time I let your grandma in here throw that dick." And she was like, "What?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "I was in the car with your grandma." <laughs> I said, "I said, I said, uh, I said I was playing Luke and the Two Line Crew," and I said, "They had recorded, they sampled the old." An old comedy record that your great grandmama listened to, and I said, I said, oh now, the lady said, uh, the the guy said, I'm gonna slap you with nine inches of limp, and my mama was smoking the joint, and said, shit, I want to see that, <laughs> and oh, it was Lord. so funny because in that moment, mm-hmm. my mama was just a human being. She was only 16 years older than me, mm-hmm. so it was like a big brother, a big sister, little brother relationship. So we already had a good relationship, but seeing my mama as a human being. It just made me giggle. And now my daughter's doing the same to me. And I got to, you know, I got to listen. And I'm just like, girl, your daddy, your daddy grew up on Luke and the Two Live Crew. It ain't much you can yeah. let me hear to shock me. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, but let's kind of build on that, the importance of listening to the youth. I tell people all the time that if you have a conversation with a youngster 
and you talk 90% of the time and they do and they listen 10% of the time yeah. that wasn't a successful conversation no nah, probably not but 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 if if you got them to open up to you yeah. and they talk 90% of the time and you listen 10% of, the other 10% was yeah. you listening then that was a successful conversation yeah. what's the importance of us listening to young people listening to the youth well you, i mean you want to know where their mind is at and you and what you want to do instead of trying to tell them what to do you just want to impart not only imp you don't just impart wisdom by telling you you impart wisdom by teaching kids to ask questions of they self mm, and of the world critical thinking yeah you know what i mean like you got to ask you know the why when who where what and once they mind get to turning like that the results because you're not already put in them what you didn't put in them right you just you just got to trust them to figure it out now you do give them some safeguards you know i don't i don't i don't want you dropping out of school i don't want you get pregnant if you can before you're married. I want you to keep a job for the education. You know what I mean? Those things are just standards. We you have to do those things to matriculate into adulthood and to be successful. You know what I mean? But I can't tell you everything to do because I don't know your path. The world changes nuances. But if I can teach you to think, if I can teach you to sit on the edge of the bed in the morning after you done did your prayers and meditate and think, what's my day going to be like today? What's the successful? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to get some measure of success. Yeah, what are the consequences of my actions? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. You're right, man. Let's Good go, and bad. Yeah, exactly. Let's go back to the west side of Atlanta. I yeah. heard in one of your songs, you, you talked about how you were dropping your children off at the church daycare. Yeah. You were sitting inside the yeah. church praying to God yeah. for purpose. Yeah, I, said, I, I remember dropping my babies off to church nervous. I remember sitting hurt all alone in the church service. Asking God to reveal me a plan of higher purpose. Yeah, yeah, higher I have purpose it for real. Right, because at the end of the day, I think that's what most of our, our young people and you know not so young people are looking for. Yeah. But I read a quote the other day on Instagram, and I said I'm gonna bring this up in the conversation. And it said that the hood never lacked talent. Yeah. What the hood lacked was resources. Yeah. And and and, and not only just lack resources, but how to use. Your resources. Damn, we don't even that. all the time lack resources. You just don't know what to do with what you got because you're being told by everybody what to do. And again, it's just it's like watching a toddler figure something out. You have people that are overdoting with children. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't don't let him. He gonna hurt himself. He gonna let him fall. That's mm -hmm. why they mostly made of water. God knew what he was doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they gonna be all right. You gotta you gotta figure it out. When a child falls, sometimes you rush to help them. They cry. Mm -hmm. And that should teach them to get attention. Then they cry, get them more attention. But when you let them alone and let them figure it out, he'll be okay. You know, mostly fathers do. Stop. Stop them. Stop. Let them, let them figure it right, out. Right, then your right, daughter, right. you might go. But especially with boys, you have to let them and trust them to figure it out and encourage that thinking. You, you, what, you're not, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, I'm trying to raise a child. Absolutely. But what you're trying to do is raise that child into a thinking human being, mm -hmm. human being that can operate. You know, mm -hmm. as human beings, we're not born with claws. We don't have extremely long teeth. We don't have a lot of weapons. So the strongest thing that's been us has been our mind and our ability to operate as a team, as a tribe. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? If we can just figure more of that out, the resources are there in some capacity. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't, they didn't have... They didn't have proper food, so you figured out how to cook scraps. Mm -hmm. And now they charge you $50 for the scraps. I, I, go, I go to a restaurant, man, I love this restaurant. I ain't even gonna give people the name, I love it so much. <laughs> it's, uh, we, me and my wife go in LA, and uh, I, I, pay, I pay $50 for a bone marrow pie. And I, I laugh so hard, because I'm like, my grandma used to make this pie for free. Mm -hmm. My grandma would go to the butcher, get scraps of beef from the, you know, the cheeks, the other thing they didn't use. She'd get the actual bone, cook the bone marrow, and she'd tell you, eat the bone marrow. Eat the, mm -hmm. And now you, get, you come around, white folks telling you, well, now you're supposed to do this, it's better for... I was like, my grandma Ben told me that. Mm -hmm. Now they pay you, you go, you go to a resort, white folks charge you to take your shoes off and walk in the grass until you recharge it. My grandma made the summer just say, hey, man, take your shoes off and walk in the yard. They knew it already. So your resources a lot of times are there, mm -hmm. but you don't respect it because you've been taught not to respect yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But you think about it, man, I, that, I didn't see them get sick a lot. I got sick two days ago. I was sick as a dog. I just fasted. I mm -hmm. just didn't eat. I just didn't eat for two days. First time I ate, I ate some chicken last night. I finally put some protein in my body. But I understood, like my grandmother, she would have us fast on Wednesdays when I was a child. Really? Yeah, yeah. Fast half day Wednesday. So she would fast, and my grandfather fasted. But they just taught us so much of what my great grandparents, my grandparents taught us, on realizing was the absolute truth. But then nobody believed it till it was on a book and Oprah, oh, you know, wow. Oprah have yeah, the book of yeah, yeah. Doctor Oz or something. Yeah. But I go back, man, I listen to even old Reverend Ike sermons. When you hear Reverend Ike talk about something divine is in you, yes sir, and you can manifest the things you want. 
You know, everybody act like manifest a new word. You know, Reverend Ike was slick, man. He was talking about manifesting in the late 70s, right, right, right. early 80s. So, you know, I'm just saying in our community, we even have the resources, but you got to believe they're worthy. Yeah, I was about to say, what do you think are the great, our greatest resources for those who don't have quote unquote resources? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, you are your greatest resource. You know, a lot of men don't mistake making again, you, you, your self determination, your will to win, your want to figure it out. Mm. You know, again, intermittent fasting is the biggest thing in the world now. Oh man, we, we only eat once a day. Us, Nuri Muhammad been telling you that the last five years. Elijah Muhammad been telling you that the last <laughs> seven years. Right. Ms. Farquhar been telling you that last 50 years. But you didn't believe it until a pop Gee. strong white boy got on there and told you about it, <laughs> which is still good for you. But just saying, man, believe your people. Mm. Give it a try. Mm. Look at them. You know, mm. when you see the FOI there in a suit, they ain't sweating. You're like, man, whatever they do, I need to do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <coughs> it's working for them. Maybe I should try it too. So the first and best resource you have is that mind and that will to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard, man, I, I remember disagreeing vehemently, man, with, with um, Dr. Bill Cosby when he went, you know, prior to all the, you know, the, the things that, that, the allegations that came, but when he was just talking about black people failing ourselves with not value in education, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So he came and spoke at my high school. I, had, you know, I wasn't in school at the time, but I went to the high school just to hear him speak, and I was ready to disagree with him. Mm -hmm. Jump up, you know, talk my, talk my talk on the behalf of black young folks and rappers. And Man, he said something. He said, hey, you have failed because you have free education and you're not taking advantage of it. Now, I know the school system is not perfect, but when it comes to reading, writing, and arithmetic, if you can read well, you can write well, and you can figure out arithmetic, there are very few things that can stop you from matriculating into something greater. Mm -hmm. Because they always gonna need good readers, they always need a good writer, and if you know arithmetic, you know everything from coding to algebra. To, and, it, and I realized that part of our culture's failure was that we stopped valuing the resource of education in the way. Mm -hmm. I don't have to care about your history. I know your history a lot, right? I know where I am in your history, so I put that truth in there. But the basic cornerstones of can our children read? Mm -hmm. Can our children write well? Can our children master mathematics? If they can do that, they can be competitive. And once you start to be competitive as an individual, you can team up with other people that are competitive. Then you become a competitive group. When you take Asian Americans, for instance, uh, my daughter now goes to a school that's more diverse. She went all the way through middle school just all black. When it came time for her to go to high school, her mother and I talked and said, well, we're going we gonna to see about some other stuff because her cousins at the all-black school. It's a great school, but I'm just like, when her cousins get together, all kind of thugging happened too, you know? <laughs> so we put her at another school. And what she learned and what I've learned is the Asian kids who typically score higher, they study in groups. Mm. Got to think about that. And individually, she a dog mm -hmm. about her studies. Mm -hmm. she, she, that Spanish grade was low. She got it up to 87 by herself. But she has a circle of friends where they all are smart. Mm -hmm. And when they study together, it's even more powerful. I agree. And, and we, have to, we have to start to emulate that. Elijah Muhammad says study, study other people that are successful. Yeah. Study groups of people that are successful. We have to do that. Yes. And we have to return the things that we did. My great-grandmother's mother... Uh, my great grandmother actually taught her mother and her children to read. So mm -hmm. everybody, as a group, they're learning together. Mm -hmm. And there's an encouragement factor because once children become confident and they become competent, ain't no competition. Mm -hmm. You know, it ain't nothing stopping them because the only thing you compete with then is in the mirror. So, Man, so we need to make education and knowledge of self a, a, a group, a group, a, a, effort, a group, a group, a group effort. effort. Black folks should stop complaining about what the public school system would do, should do, or could do, and focus on the things that the public education school can do right. You can teach me two plus two is four. You can, you can teach me proper grammar and punctuation skills, right? You can, you, can teach me, you can teach me the very basics of that. Take that, and then on Saturdays, we should be having our own school. Saturday right. school. You know, just like, just like other cultures have. You know, my, my, my Jewish friends went to regular school, and then on Saturday, they had to go, like, for others. I'm saying, what you going? Well, we go, we learn about a Torah, we learn Hebrew, at the, at the back, I remember I went to the synagogue with my accountant. At the back of the synagogue was all these cards with the businesses. So if they're going to look to do business, they look to do business with one another first. 
And I'm just like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. When I went to a Presbyterian church, you know, all denominations in that church, but the Presbyterians focused on having their own school in terms of how do we teach Christianity from a Presbyterian standpoint, mm -hmm. who are the Presbyterian carpenters, who are the Presbyterian plumbers. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, okay, so black people, really that's all we need mm -hmm. to do. We need to focus on what is our Saturday school and our after school. Mm -hmm. what, what two hours are we going to give on a Saturday? Like all of us, Swahili is the most common spoken language, I think, in Africa. The brothers in jail already put it together. They already started speaking Swahili so they could get around the guards talking. So those brothers are resources. As those brothers get out, why are those brothers not the ones teaching the young brothers Swahili? You mm -hmm. know, we should already know how to say hello. We should already know words to be able to speak in a room full of people because other people do it. Mm -hmm. Other groups of people can speak in a room full of people. And now you go get your nails done and you don't know what the hell yeah, they're saying. saying. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. But you know at the end of it, 125. Right. <laughs> and they want $125. Right. They say that better. They say it anything. <laughs> they say it the whole time. So I think that we have to we have to do that. We have to understand everything does not have to be public. Everything does not have to be validated by other people. Some things are best kept private. Every conversation is not meant for everybody. Agreed. You know, my grandfather used to tell me, man, stay out of white folks' business. And I never knew what that meant. Uh -huh. But <laughs> <laughs> what it meant was mind your own business, yeah. tend to your own house, tend to your own crops. And that way, your community would be what you wanted to be versus you looking at other communities saying, why, why, why? Mm -hmm. you know? We'd be less concerned about whether or not they're going to teach that black people benefited from slavery. Yeah. Because we knew on Saturdays we're teaching the truth to our youngsters. Absolutely. And I, I got some opinions on that I won't even talk about. I said some, better, best, some stuff best I say it. Okay, so, you know if you mean? say so. Yeah, so I mean it is, because mm -hmm. until you really learn what it was for real, you're not going to hear the news. Like, one of the best things that happened to me and, and members of my crew was when the doctor said, hey, man, you're pre-diabetic, you better get it together now. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that gives you a, a, another discipline. You mm -hmm. say, okay, I got to, I got to, I, baby, I got to go read How to Eat to Live again. Yeah. I got to focus on eating like this. I got to have a certain discipline. Mm -hmm. So the, it, 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 diabetes ravages us, right? Yeah. But hearing that news, the me and members of my crew, made us transform the yeah. way me move. self -improved. I done lost a little weight. So, you know, I'm not saying slavery was good or beneficial. I'm saying, boy, if I'm the only person know how to pick cotton and we just got free, oh, you have to pay me to pick some cotton now, baby. Yeah, they ain't free no more. Mm. Yeah, you're not, I'm not your slave no more. Now we're in a free market. Now we're existing in a capitalist system. That go back now, to using now, your resources. Now, huh? now, yeah, now, now it's not. And, and for people who don't know this, it's important you do know this. Because I used to wonder when I was a kid, how does one buy one's family out of slavery? If I'm a slave, I'm not getting paid. But every farmer, you have a master class in the South. Those were the rich people who own damn near everything. They still do to this day. Crawford Long was the guy who invented um, an, an anesthesia to put people to sleep to, to essentially in the Civil War, cut their limbs and stuff off, right? He owns part of my father's family. I'm not, this ain't, and this ain't no myth of no hypothesis. This is, we were owned by his family. Then I'm of that was lineage, it, right? In Georgia? Yep, in Georgia. Crawford Long. Named a hospital for him. He sits in the state capitol now. Um, they asked me to come to the family unit. I said, no, I'm okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, um, but, but, but this man... Having owned, having owned human beings, at some point, somebody on there was smart enough to start another leg of this family, had this black family. They would use their resources to buy their own land. So my great-grandfather had a farm. My great-grandfather didn't have to be dependent on anybody. His children didn't. There were things that he took from that that was a horrible experience, but it enriched him in a way that allowed him to be a better man. There was things that Moses learned in the house of Pharaoh that the Israelites needed when they were wandering through that wilderness for 40 years. And even though he couldn't go into the promised land, he made sure Aaron knew, hey, these are the things you need to know and not know. So when you get to the promised land, this is how we should be operating. Mm -hmm. So you have to find, even in your suffering, a purpose. God has not allowed you to suffer for nothing. So I used to want to say, so how do the slave buy themselves out of slavery? Well, since everybody wasn't rich, you had poor white farmers who could not afford to own a slave. On Sundays, slaves had the day off, people mm -hmm. who weren't slaves. Mm -hmm. They went to they, whoever owned them and said, look, I got Sundays off. I ain't really into church and singing. So my wife is going to go to church and sing. I would like to lease myself out to this other farm, and then we'll do a 60-40 split or 50-50 split. And that's when a teacher, Miss Baraki, 
um, who was under Dr. Asa Hilliard's curriculum out of Clark. When Ms. Baraki helped me understand that slaves weren't just mindless animals being used, they used their mind, they used their ingenuity. They rented themselves out, kept the money, split the money, and then after a certain tax was, with taxes paid, now I've bought my wife out. Now, my wife will go rent herself out to sew. It's a seamstress in town. I've learned how to sew. It's all I've been doing since I was five years old. My skills are valuable to this white woman who needs. So now I go sew. Now you have people that say, even though this horrible thing has happened to us, the skills that I've got from here on a free market on Sundays matter, and they were able to do that. But if we don't give our children the whole truth, they start to think, man, we was just lowly animals, and that's all we'll ever be, and that's not the truth. They start, they, start to think, they start to think to themselves, man, the, minimum, the skills I have of barbering or carpentry or electrician, it ain't enough because I didn't go to college. But that's not true. I don't care how much college you have. If you, I got an uncle who's autistic. He can't count $100, but he can build his whole shop. Mm -hmm. I can count $100. I can't put a hammer and a nail to save my life. So who you think going to be most valuable in the market when they got to rebuild the infrastructure? Right, right, right. You know? right, right. So that, um, we have to start to see even the worst of suffering has some blessing in it for us. So again, I'm not defending and saying slavery was beneficial um, in terms of everything was hunky-dory, but even in the midst of slavery, we figured out you a way can, to prevail. You can, you, can, you can make anything beneficial We to figured you. out a way to prevail, man. Think about that. Hmm. We haven't been free 60 years of apartheid. My parents were born in apartheid, 1955 and 1959. Jim Crow was still raging. Apartheid. We couldn't even walk in every door, you know what I mean? But you look at it, look at their son. Their son's a multimillionaire now. Their great-grandchildren will never want if they apply themselves. You understand what I'm saying? That is, that is something to celebrate. So I, I'm not, you know, I'm never jumping on the side to say, oh, it was good for us. I saw a white boy on TV. He thought he was smart. He said, um, America was built by white folks. And yada, yada, yada. And I thought to myself, you might have laid out, and I'll give you Benjamin Banneker as a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Whoever the person was that was designed in Washington, D.C., I think it might have been a Frenchman or something, he got pissed off with the other white folks in America. He left. If Benjamin Banneker had not had a photographic memory to say, well, these were the plans he laid out, you wouldn't have Washington, D.C. as you have it today. Because he was a lowly assistant and he remembered, he was the person able to do that. When they burnt the White House down, who were the people that rebuilt it? So when you hear somebody say, y'all didn't build America, I don't even argue with them. Because if you, I own a business, so you can't argue with me. If you give me a choice between free labor and market rate, I'm going to take free labor all day. So you can't tell me we didn't build America because I don't care who had drafted up the plans, who put hammer to nail. Who, put, who did the work? Cotton was one of the most valuable resources in the world. If that cotton didn't get picked by these black hands, and those, and, and those black hands that were up north working in textiles and industry, if they didn't thread that cotton and make it to something to be sold, what would this country have been? Slavery gave this country a 250-year head start economically. If the Haiti wouldn't have sent the French backpacking, America never would have had Louisiana, never would have had Texas, or anything worse than that. Because they kicked the French's ass in such a bad way, they had to leave, and economically, they couldn't, they couldn't fight the ex-Brits that were over here anymore for this land. So the reason you even have America, and Frederick Douglass talked about this, the only reason you have it is because a bunch of Haitians kicked a bunch of French folks' ass. And we don't even see, we don't even know the proper arguments because we've only accepted the fact that we was just lowly slaves. But if you see yourself as just a lowly slave and not the most important cog in the machine, you'll forever have low self-confidence. Mm -hmm. But if everybody said, man, we ain't picking no cotton, no cotton got picked, how would the South have gotten rich? Alexander Stevens said, who was the vice president, Stevens, there's a Stevens County name for him in Georgia. Vice president of the Confederacy said, the cornerstone of the Confederacy is slave. And it wasn't just we want to keep people as pets. It was the, economic, it was the economic engine. My brother. My brother. It's that simple. So I don't even listen to white folks say, well, you didn't build this country. Shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the, the vice president said it right there. Mm -hmm. It's the cornerstone. The cornerstone is the most important piece. Mm. That's in building the building. So you just have to smile and accept that we suffered through it, but you have to move with the confidence to know you're competent to do it for yourself. There was another Confederate um, official who was about to lose his land. Because when the union came down, they said, we confiscating all this shit. If you're a white man, you own it, we taking it. One of his enslaved men saying, hey, sign it over to me. I'll own it. When they come back, 
when they leave, I'll sign over to you. Now, I'm sure he kept some land for himself, but his, his master wasn't even smart enough to broker that deal. Mm-hmm. You, you said, that we, had, we had a brother, I forget his name. His name was Biggs, I think Robert Biggs, was in South Carolina, stole a Confederate ship, got the Confederate ship up to the Union Army, flashed the letter over to him. They ought to have a, somebody said they ought to have a movie about him. But they don't want you to hear that because they don't want you to think, oh, man, you was just lowly. And I don't mean just the people who oppressed you. It's some people that benefit from your oppression that's, that look like you. They say you're your friend. But they got no 501c3s, boy. They can't get no donations. They can't live as high as they. So they need you to think you only vibrated low. Man, you've been outsmarting. You've been outsmarting oppression your whole way here. You've been resisting your whole way here. Mm-hmm. The whole four, five hundred years you've been here, you've been pushing back. You've been figuring it out. And mm-hmm. you're going to keep doing that. And that's the confidence you have to have. What happened to us was wrong. The way they do us now is wrong. But boy, when your mind is right and you move righteous, it's amazing what you're able to do. Look what Marcus Garvey was able to do. You know, I don't care what you think about. I tell people, I don't argue between Abrahamic religion. I don't argue Jewish, Muslim, or Christian because they all had the same father in Abraham. So that's family fights. And I don't get in the middle of family (laughs) fights. What I say, though, is you show me another organization that takes men that have thought less of themselves, that have been on the bottom, women that have been used, that have been abused, that are coming out of prison, coming out of doldrums of addiction. You show me another organization that gives you fine, upstanding citizens like that, then I say, man, I might be wrong, but I know I'm not wrong. Because I knew my brother before he got in the nation. Yes, and I know him now. I know his wife and his children. I see the business he set for itself. So anything and everything is possible when you believe. Their job is to get you to disbelieve, and I'm not just talking about your clear and open enemy. Some people profit from your disbelief, and as long as you let them profit from your disbelief by not believing in yourself, then it continues. Everybody sees a rise in homelessness now. I say, man, why do we see such a rise in homelessness? Like, this is crazy, because it's not just your city. It's in every city. All I do is travel around the world Mm -hmm. singing and dancing. But I'm like, but now they're saying they got monies coming in. And they say, well, if, the, if, we, if we solve the homeless crisis, no money keeps coming. Well, mm-hmm. if no money keeps coming, how do I keep my job as special advisor to homelessness committee? Right. You know, when you look at gang violence in Los Angeles, many of the brothers that uh, started 501c3s that were former gang members that are effective at ending the violence, they say, well, Michael, when the violence drops too low, then they drop the police budgets to combat violence. Right. So then they take our money and then violence rises up again. And then the police would get more money. The police forces get more. And then they said, then they double back around us and say, well, we got some more money for it. Well, that's a wicked system because it requires violence Mm -hmm. for the state to get more money Mm -hmm. and for the people who really trying to solve the problem. At some point, if the brothers just say, we're not doing it. Yeah. We're not going to kill each other. Because if you solve the problem, then you can't get funding for the solution. Absolutely. 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 Let's give Billy a kill. (laughs) Okay, so I know you saw the fight this weekend. Nah, I was on stage, man, but I, I, I saw clips, man. It was, it was woo. Yeah, it was a rough one. Yeah. <laughs> Terrence Crawford versus Errol Spence Jr. Yeah. Uh, the one, one-sided affair. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge Errol Spence fan. Yeah. Was then, still am now, yeah. right? But shout out to Terrence Crawford. I yeah. wanted Errol Spence to win, but I didn't want Terrence Crawford to lose. Yeah. But the point I wanted to make is um, I like the way both of these brothers – held a very, very high-level production, yeah. but it never got disrespectful. No, classy. You know what I'm saying? Very classy. 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 And uh, they both made, I think, like eight figures. They both fed their families. Um, and it may not have been the outcome that some of us wanted. Yeah. What is the importance of us as black people being able to compete and collaborate at the same time without attacking one another? We got to get rid of ego and insecurity. One thing I want to mention, I think I, think I saw Spence had bought like 65 acres of land. Yeah. And he said, I never grew up around horses and cattle and all that. He did that, and he said he was buying like 200 more. That was just a beautiful thing. Yeah. And, and seeing how Crawford and he in, enacted afterwards was just class. Like, you know, there, the, everything about our culture has not been bad. Even if you look at gang culture, some things I learned when the brothers say, man, well, we just going to run a fade. Mm-hmm. You know, we've we been, we been talking about each other too long. Let's, let's, get let's just go with. behind that. Ain't yeah. nobody turn their phones off. Right. We're going to get it off of that on the other right. side. We're going to wipe the blood off. We're going to hug. And we did, we did that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and I respect that because at, at the end of the day, we did. You mm-hmm. know, and at the end of the day, we men and women. And we're going to have differences. But it's important, again, 
that if we doing it, if we doing it on television as a sport in front of people, that no matter how competitive we get, no matter how much shit talk we give each other, when we get off that field, we still black people. We still gotta love wow. one another. We still gotta speak highly and respectfully of one another. You know what I mean? And I and I and I just I learned that lesson when I watched Ali and um and Frazier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ali Ali later just said, you know, he understood he, some of the things he said was too mean. Mm -hmm. He didn't understand he was really poking his brother. And Frazier, eventually, they, they reconciled. And that, that was a beautiful thing. But we got to seek reconciliation with each other. I, um, I forget which holiday is named for, but again, I got my, one of my Jewish friends told me about they have a, a, maybe Yom Kippur. I, I think it's Yom Kippur where they, 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 they get together and you get the chance to ask once a year to, for, to, to be forgiven. Right. Look, man, I, 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 yeah, you're talking to a little man. I know I did you wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and the person has the right to forgive or not forgive, but you come back next, you're like, hey, I, I know I was wrong. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And just because you forgive somebody don't mean you have to be buddy, buddy don't mean you have to hang out. But you do have to let that burden off yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you carry that burden, man, it'll carry you into cancer, it'll carry you into disease, it'll carry you into mental illness, it'll carry you into a lot of stuff that you don't deserve to be carried into because what you're doing is, you holding a burden that ain't meant for you to hold. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, ultimately God is the judge. You not. So you don't have, you, don't, you, you, you should try to carry that load. It's not, it's not meant for you. So I think that the way those brothers handled themselves was a class act. I think that, you know, I love what Deion Sanders and Andre Risen talked about when they played each other when Deion first left. Mm -hmm. and, and, they, and they got the fighting on the field really quickly. And Deion said, we just had to get it out. And, that, <laughs> and after that, and man, he's such a class act. I'm, I'm so glad Coach has, has been a, a friend and mentor to me the last couple of years, you know what I mean? Deion and, Sanders? Yeah, I've learned so much from him. You know, he called me, I was in the mall, and he just, he called like twice a day. Coach called me, I said, he said, I'm just calling to see how you're doing. He said, yeah, yeah, it's me. I'm just, I'm just like, God damn, it's Dion. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's such a, he's such an open and transparent person in terms of his, 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 his downfalls, his shortcomings, his, 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 his thinking, his triumphs. That as a man, I've learned a lot by watching him. So seeing him talk about him and rising and how they were super competitive, but in that moment after they got it out, it's over. And yeah. brothers gonna have to start being like that, you know, you because mm -hmm. you know you can't apologize to your brother once he did. So why kill him? Mm -hmm. Yes, please, please. I, I, thank you. I, I wanted to ask while you're on that point because I've been wanting to ask that uh, a little while ago. You mentioned every conversation is not for the public. No. You know, we talk about that often. Yeah. We try to make sure we stay in communication, you know, uh, with others. And I wanted you, Mike, to touch on why the barbershop, you know, is important. You yeah. Know, what that significance is. Because while we're here, it, it was not, you know, just a place to pick. Why not nah, nah. own a barbershop? What is the significance yeah. of conversations in the barbershop? How those private conversations, you know, bring collaboration. Yeah. Uh, and, and more togetherness in our community. Yeah, the, the, so, you know, there, there, there's, I grew up in all black cities, so all, you know, it was majority black city, but my neighborhood was all black. Mm -hmm. And all black meaning everybody from working class black people like my grandparents were there in a little 900 square foot house raising all these children to the richest black developer in America at one time, Herman Russell, you know, mm -hmm. and Dr. King's parents had lived, had lived there and uh, Cynthia McKinney and her father, Billy McKinney, U.S. Uh, representatives. So all these people are here. There were just certain conversations. There just one mint for outside that neighborhood. Right. Those conversations happened right there in the living room. Right. And past the living room, they happened in the barbershops. In the barbershops, our hair is our hair. You know, you can go to white folk restaurant to eat. You know, mm -hmm. you can go to you can go to other folk places and play tennis, and play golf. But when you we black folk mess with our house, we don't trust everybody with our house. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when when you in the barbershop, you see in a plethora of people from different class in our community, but they all together. Good point. And and they get a chance to discuss things. Yeah. And it's a safe space. Yeah. Your barber, your barber is damn near like a therapist in the problems they hear going on and the advice they give. But more than that, they, they like gatekeepers to what the community is really thinking. You mm -hmm. know, when it was time to win the election for Kasim Reed, for Keisha Lance Bottoms, even for Andre Dickens, first place I'm going to the barbershop. Let me go to barbershops and beauty shops. Let me go to where people are already talking because they know it's safe to talk in there. Mm -hmm. You'll hear a radically different conversation in the barbershop than you'll hear in the nail shop because the nail shop ain't owned by you. Right. So you're going to watch kind of what you say. Right, right, you're right. in the barbershop, you're free, and you know people not taking your business outside in that capacity. So for me, only barbershops, I understand that, you know, we're not great clips. We're not super cuts. You know, we're not, and we're building a chain. You know, my wife and I with the swag shop, Shade Washing Room Shop. So we have them, 
On the south side near the airport, we have one in-state farm arena in Atlanta. Yeah. We just got funding to expand to three more. But I realize that our barbershops are a social center. Yeah. They're not just a place you go get a haircut. It isn't just the accommodation of getting beautified. It really is, on a social level, it's a golf club. Mm -hmm. On a social level, it's the, after you've played a few rounds of tennis, because the, 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 that's where your deals get done. Mm -hmm. When you think about local politics, your local politics does not get done under the gold dome. Your local politics gets done in fraternity meetings, um, um, uh, uh, social clubs like tennis and golf. You know, you, went, you always wonder why, why people want to learn how to play golf. Well, that's what people decide they like you. People mm -hmm. who got the money to mm -hmm. invest in you. You know what I'm saying? Brad Jordan was a years ahead of all the rappers in playing golf. He understood this before, before the comedians, before the athletes started playing golf, before Michael Jordan. I heard Scarface talking about golf. like golf. But golf makes sense once you start getting around money. When I ask people, what, what sport do you think most bankers and stuff played in college? It's lacrosse. I never gave a damn about lacrosse. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, the people who could play basketball, football, but who still wanted to be active, they're going to hang in a circle. They're going to click. So I think our barbershop is our exclusive place to discuss business, to discuss politics, to discuss where we want to go. That's why I value owning a series of shops. I mean, uh, um, owning the franchise of shops. That's why I value coming. I, I go to other barbershops that's not mine still to this day. I just pop up because I want to know What's going on in the community? Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to know who are the people, what's happening there, and you're going to get honest answers there. Yeah, you can put your hand on the pulse of the community Absolutely. in the barbershop. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So at the end of the day, Mike, like I remember the first time you and I, well, the first time I was in the same room with you was back in the 2000s. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan had come to Atlanta yep, and he yep. called together a meeting. My man with, Bear brought me. He's here with me today. With all of the artists. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you got up and you spoke that day. Yes, yes, sir. It's, on, it's on YouTube. Yeah, the, the things that came out of your mouth that day really set the tone for that entire weekend. Yeah, yeah. And I remember Minister Farrakhan looking at you and he, he put his hand on his heart. He yeah. said, this is a beautiful yeah. brother. Absolutely. absolutely. Where, where does that relatable spirituality come from? And I call it relatable spirituality because um, it's not necessarily religious. I mean, I just, I man, he loved black people. You know, I, I, again, I don't argue between the Abraham and religion. I'm not going to get into no family arguments. All y'all all y'all are here because of Abraham. Y'all should figure that out, right? <laughs> yes, sir. My thing, though, is, man, black people, are, Dr. John Henry Clark said the, 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 that, that Africans have no friends. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's ever aligned themselves with us at the time that the advantage was for them betrayed us. Mm. You know, and, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not harping on everybody. I'm just saying... When you, when you look at throughout history, look at Frederick Douglass said, um, <laughs> something is of no color, something is of no sex. Go look the quote up. What he was basically saying at the time was, give men and women the right to vote right now at the same time. They didn't do that. They gave black men the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you saw the abolitionist movement separate from the women's suffrage movement. At that time, when black men were going to vote in South Carolina and black women were standing outside with shotguns and rifles to protect them from the Ku Klux Klan, white women were so offended that black men got the opportunity to vote first that the women's suffrage movement separated from the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, the Daughters of the Confederacy pop up. Mm. And the Daughters of Confederacy pop up. Then you see Confederate monuments. Then you see different teaching in school. So your ally was not your friend. Mm -hmm. Your ally was not your co-conspirator. Mm -hmm. My measure for a co-conspirator and a friend is John Brown. Mm -hmm. If you ain't willing to John Brown it with me, meaning take life yeah, yeah, yeah. and put your life on the line right. and be willing to die, you just an ally. Yeah. And allies change <laughs> after wars. <laughs> Russia got, and America John, was they allies. They got a John Brown in with you, Mike? If, if you got the John Brown. Uh, and otherwise, I'll take an ally. Mm -hmm. But understand that after the war, we might have to do Russia and the United States because that's all I've seen. You know, what, the, Germany was kicking everybody ass. The Russia and the United States didn't even like just say, we got to figure this shit out now. Mm -hmm. This Hitler going, he going to take it all mm -hmm. if we don't. So they had the ally, but the minute the war was over, they just chopped up the world. And say, this is mine, this is mine, but we're not friends no more. So we have to understand that your ally is not forever. You know what I mean? And that don't mean that I don't like anybody. That don't mean that I can't be friends, which I encourage people to befriend people who don't look like you, who not ethnically like you, so you can find ways to intersect the cross pattern. But you have to understand that it is your duty to take care of you, yourself, your family, and your greater community. At the end of the day, we all we got. We all we got. We yes, all sir. we going to have. We've all we've ever had. The original man and woman. That's it. 
You know, mm -hmm. that's it. No matter what you call yourself, you call yourself Muslim, you call yourself Hebrew, right. you call yourself a Moor, right. you can say you indigenous, right. whatever you call yourself. Right. And they probably going to call you nigga when you leave the room. Right. But whatever you <laughs> call yourself, understand that it's just you. Yes, sir. So move as a unit. Move like that. I was listening to an uh, African brother, and he was saying, you know, that, that the differences between African Americans and Africans that sometimes, one night sometimes he was saying that because we were brought here and robbed of our true identity that we didn't know. And that's not all the way true, too. Many of the brothers, I was reading about a, a slave that was brought here, a, an enslaved man that was brought here that was a Muslim. Mm -hmm. you know, so when it argues who brought Islam, was it Noble to Drew Ali, was it Master Farad, Muhammad, was it? This brother was 200 years before any of them. Mm -hmm. He never stopped practicing Islam, right? Mm -hmm. But what I've realized is maybe we got here because we leaned too much into tribalism. Maybe we got here because we start seeing ourselves as I'm Ibu, I'm Yoruba. That's, that's a good that, point. And, and, we, and we have to understand that's that, a good the, point. The, that ultimately being robbed of our history was a wrong. But if I had to find any blessed in it, I don't differentiate between the original man and woman. Because one thing I do know, before I named myself as a part of a tribe, before I gave my God a different name or decided to worship an Orisha, or th what I do know is that God put us here first. Mm. The first human being, the matriarchal DNA, the matriarchal, I forget the, the, the word, I'm saying it wrong, DNA is of a black woman in Eastern Africa. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, if you, if, if I already, no, I told people all the time, y'all be arguing about who they are online. I said, Elijah Muhammad already solved that problem for me. You're the original man and woman. Right. That's it. Whatever God put here first, that's you. And that's how I move. So no matter what you call yourself, the planet Earth. The cre well, no matter what you call yourself, I recognize that God put you here first. And we are of the same bloodline. Yes, and I respect sir. that. So however you work, if you worship on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I can come to your worship. I can be home there. I can pray with you. You're I can brothers I, I, and sisters. I, I, we brothers and sisters. We mm -hmm. here first. You know, and, and if we start to reinterpret our thinking, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can maybe we can come together again and understand no matter what makes me feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of what you name yourself, what chapter you belong to, what fraternity or sorority, no matter how it feel, God saw fit to make us first. Thank and if you. I'm made in God's image, how can I treat you like you anything but God? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned uh, Matulu Shakur. Absolutely. Uh, man, God I'll bless you, please, with, with Brother Matulu Shakur, yeah. who, for those who did not know, was a political prisoner. I want to say he did 36 years in prison. Yeah. Correct yeah, me yeah. if Tupac I'm wrong. Step. Yeah. Uh, uh. Um, Asada Shakur, yeah. still uh, in Cuba, yeah. uh, kicked out of America. I hope they'll never get him. Never yeah, home. Exactly, yeah. exactly. What do you think is the culture's responsibility to the political prisoners who are still incarcerated Man, I, I was I was talking to I was talking to uh, a wise sister who started you know billion dollar business in black woman and she said <coughs> what well, she gave me a challenge in my lifetime I got to figure this out mm -hmm. <coughs> 40 million black people in this country uh, I figure 20 million of them are above the poverty line if you give me 10 percent that's two million give me five percent give me one million black people Give me $2.50 a week. Give me $10 a month. Give me that. One million. Give me that. That's what? Roughly $10 million. Yeah, If you math. can give me $100, we'll make $100 million a month. Mm -hmm. We should have a fund that takes care of our own. We should take mm -hmm. care of our old. We should take care and build our own schools. And then it's just $10. It's just teaching. what you waste on fast food, mm -hmm. on alcohol, meat, marijuana. Mm -hmm. I, I got $10 of marijuana money mm -hmm. to give every month. But if one million of us do it, just one million, mm -hmm. one million out of 40, you will have $120 million a year of a slush fund to take care of not only political prisoners, but all freedom fighters who got released. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have that to take care of schooling in terms of your Saturday schools. If we do that, if we just have the discipline, one million mm -hmm. of us, if we have the discipline to give $10 a month, that is $120 million a year. And mm -hmm. what can't you do with that? Right, right, man. Beautiful answer. What do you hope what are your highest hopes for the accomplishment of this album, Michael? Uh, man, I want to I wanna do like, you know, I, in terms of personal, just, you know, selfishly, I'm still a rapper. Yeah. I want all the attention and the fame and the money, all that on hey, rapper hey, stuff, right? Hey, man, we want so, that for you, brother. I, I, would, I feel like this is a miseducation of Lauryn Hill moment. Um, mm -hmm. what, what that album was for black women 
and I saw my sisters just glow. I got five sisters. I saw my baby mamas just glow. I saw black women glowing. I think that this record does that for black and working class That's a men. That's good analogy. Yeah, and I, I, I want to lead the Grammys with an arm full of trophies too. Mm -hmm. And I want to drop another one and another one. And I, and I want to use my platform to empower people who organize it on a daily basis, you know, like Ted's, you know, like Georgia Youth Build in Georgia, like Gary Davis at the Next Level Boys Academy. That's it. I wanted to, I wanted to smoke weed, rap, go to the Blue Flight. That was my plan. God just had other plans. Right, 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 right. He, he messed around. I got educated. Uh, I got illuminated on certain things. So I understand that with getting what you want from God comes with some responsibilities too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To and my, res my, my responsibility in my community is to uplift, to be a walking example of upliftment. And, and try my very best to uplift others by, by empowering the people who do the work. Mm -hmm. See, I used to be an organizer every week. My mind was on organizing. Now, because I got the job I wanted, God gave me the blessing of going around the globe singing and dancing, I realized I'm a mobilizer. Mm -hmm. It's my job now that when an organizer calls it, this is what I'm organizing to show up to mobilize people to come mm -hmm. to hear. You, you, know? you help to pull the parts together. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You, come, you, just, you just serve as a caller. Hey, I'm, I'm here today. You know, that's what, you know, later in... The SCLC's um, existence, not later, but in the later 60s, what you got was SNCC doing the organizing. You got John Lewis, Stokely Carmichael at the time, and Kwame Touré. You had them young students firing, you know, in, in, in Alabama and in Georgia, South Georgia, getting people out there. You know, and what Dr. King did, when he showed up, well, he brought the crowd, mm -hmm. the mobilizers. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I've understood that. What I want selfishly, I want to march in the grabs. I want to walk out. I want to, I want to go from playing... 3,000 people theaters to, to 12, 15, 30,000 people in arenas. I want mm -hmm. that and more. But I don't want my life to have only been about that. I would have liked to have affected greater change before I get out of here. I would have liked to have led people to a spirituality in which they see something divine in themselves. Mm -hmm. you know. And that's people across all race and color and code. I, had a, I played um, Charleston. Uh, South Carolina, a white boy came up to me, man. It was amazing. He had on his braids cap. He said, Mike, I'm just a poor white boy from the Appalachian. And I identify with every single word of that album. Because the worker class, no matter the color, you suffer under the same masters. And they mm -hmm. brutal. You know, mm -hmm. the same people that named us nigga named crackers crackers. It wasn't just because they whipped crackers. It was a lower standard of white people that they saw that was not beneficial to them. And they decided that they're going to annex them out, too. And then when they got too friendly with us, they said, hold on. This club called White Folks, we're going to open the doors. We're going to let you in. Mm -hmm. But you can't go singing and dancing with niggas no more. Mm -hmm. That happened to the Irish. That happened to the Italians. They did it to Jewish people, too. They annexed all those white people out. But as power consolidated in this country, they needed to identify where power would stay. Listen to Dr. Francis Chris Wilson when she talks about it. You know, people... You got to really study and prove yourself worthy. I, I said it was funny. I was talking to Clip during an interview in Chicago, and I named all these things. I named Henry Osawatana. I named, um, I named uh, of Muse and Men by Zora Neale Hurston. I named some other writers and stuff. And then I say, man, I'm, and I'm just a guy sitting in front of the stove with some dope in his pocket. You mm -hmm. know? And a lot of times we don't understand how much knowledge is around us and talk about resources because we see them as junkies and addicts. But man, they people who the revolution, they done fought it, they done fought it all they could, and they done got so hurt and deeply, deeply, um, just deeply cut that they didn't have the power to keep moving on, and they using things to pacify themselves. But you gotta know that knowledge is everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't, I don't want, I don't want a man that's never been broken to tell me, to tell me how to repair myself. I, I need a man that's had to repair himself. Mm -hmm. You know, and while we doing that, we got to make sure we build strong children. Like Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken, broken men. men. Yes, sir. So the broken men that are repaired, they should be teaching those children to be strong. Each one, is teach like, one. You Absolutely. did the album, you did a record on junkies. Just kind of, yeah, it's called, just a little bit. Yeah, it's called Something for Junkies. And uh, just because, you know, like Curtis Mayfield did, Fred is dead for Superfly. Junkies are, are people who have addictions are not respected and actually detested in our community. Mm -hmm. But why? We all have some addictions. Right. We all have been, we all, you, usually the people I've encountered that are addicts are deeply sensitive people. Very loving people, but they, 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 the world is so that they don't always have what it takes to fight it and they succumb to that because it numbs them. But I think in the black community, the biggest mistake we made 
disciples, we became slave masters. We know that car cost $30 a wash at a proper car wash, and we would rather pay that man 15 Well, I mean, no, not even 15 We would rather pay him 5 or 10 because we can get away Like you say, pay your people a, de a decent and, wage. Man, man, what I say, man, to my J's working hard to get paid, pay them yeah. fair wage and do not treat your people man, like Man, go slaves. listen to Michael, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> go listen, listen to Michael. All listen to them. Yeah, so much knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, yeah. uh, and just great music. Yeah. We talked about resources in the black community. Yeah. I want to say to you, brother, in my humble opinion, you you are, you are a great resource. I appreciate to you so much. our culture, brother. Thank you so much for coming by. I appreciate you. Um, shout out to Willie D. Shout out to Willie, Willie D. D. Live. My brother he couldn't be here today. Yeah. Right. I hope I did a good job, dear brother. Great job. Uh, any parting words, dear brother? Man, you can. You will. You must. You can. You will. You must.